Welcome as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Today we're looking at Titus chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. I love this book. This is a letter written to Titus who's leading the church in the island of Crete. There's a lot of issues going on and Paul is establishing his credentials because he's writing a personal letter to Titus, but he wants Titus to read this letter to the churches. He doesn't want him to put it away in his nightstand. So in the first verse, he talks about Paul, I'm a bond servant, I'm an apostle of, of, of Jesus Christ according to, to the faith of everybody who's chosen and received the gift of salvation, and I do it in the acknowledgement of the truth with accords with, with godliness. And then in verse 2 he says, in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began. Eternal life. Barclay says this, the Christian gospel does not in the first place offer men and women, an intellectual creed or a moral code, it offers them life, the very life of God, which God, who cannot lie, promised. Eternal life in Christ Jesus, it's not a hope uh, that, that we have that we kind of wish for. It's a hope that we know. We know that you may know the hope of your calling, not that you might wish that you have hope, but you know it. And in this sense, hope is an anticipation founded on something that's more than just, well, I hope my hope is well-founded. It's no, I know that I have hope because it's founded on the promises of God and he can't lie. So if he says this is what's happening, this is what's going to happen. Now, then we go on to verse 3 in Titus chapter 1. But has it in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Saviour? Paul knew that preaching was a way that God's eternal work and purposes was going to meet people in today's life. Preaching is the way that God's word is made evident. It's manifested. Okay? So that's preaching is a part of it. That's why if you're not listening to preaching, somebody who's rightly dividing the word of truth, which I understand is difficult, I get that, um, but preaching is how God allows people to come into contact with God's truth. It, and that's how it's manifested in them, is that they go to, that's why you go to church and you listen to the message and you're like, wow, that's amazing. And it manifests itself in you. Now, yes, you have to be careful about who it is you put yourself under. I understand that. But if you remove that from your life and you're somebody who's like, no, I don't listen to preaching. I just need me and you know, I'm good with the Bible then you're misunderstanding what the Apostle Paul set up the New Testament church for. Now, Jesus, when he committed the New Testament foundational church to be set up by the Apostle Paul and all the other disciples and the 72 and all that, um, he knew that in due time, the word of God would be manifested. Christianity comes into this world at a time when it was actually very uniquely possible for what Jesus had done to be spread. Now, we would think, I would imagine, I've thought this, I wonder why Jesus didn't come when the internet was available and you know he could just do live streaming and everybody would know him and wouldn't. But God's timing is perfect timing. So let's look at the timing of why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. So I'm going to, some observations from Guzik. There was a common language, Greek, which was the language of trade, business, and literature. There were virtually no frontiers because of the massive nature of the Roman Empire. So you can go anywhere. Travel was comparatively easy, even though it was slow. It was very safe because of the security that the Roman Empire had brought to roads and sea routes. You'd go anywhere and it was safe. The world was largely at peace under the Pax Romana. What's the Pax Romana? That's the Latin title of the period of peace that was under Roman rule from uh, just before Jesus to about 200 years later. Now, not only this, but the world was uniquely conscious of its need for a Messiah and a Savior. Barclay says this, There was never a time when the hearts of men were more open to receive the message of salvation which the Christian missionaries brought. It was the perfect time. In due time manifested his word. Paul says, now, that word was committed to me. Big words. Paul knew the work of preaching was entrusted to him, but not to him only. Preaching was committed to, to all these people that were commissioned to do 
what God called them to do. And in a way, if you're a Christ follower, you're called to preach, sharing the good news. Not just reading the Bible. For example, if all you ever did with somebody was just, hey, walk up to them and just read a Bible verse at them, they would look at you and be like, okay, thanks for that. What does it mean? So when you share what it means, now you're preaching. You're just not doing it from behind a pulpit on a platform in front of lots of people. Now, let's move on to verse 4. To Titus, so now Paul's established who he is. Who's he writing this letter to? To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, we actually don't know anything about Titus from the book of Acts, written by Luke. He is absent in that particular record. But he must have been an associate of Paul's during that time because we read about him in other parts and other letters, other parts of the Bible, other letters were, were that were um, along those same same time frames. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, 2 Corinthians 8, 3, 23, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 18 talks about Titus. Now, Titus uh, is a person who was sent to Corinth. And somebody else was sent with him. And he was described in the one of, in the passage of 2 Corinthians 8 and 12 as a brother who is famous among all the churches and commonly identified with Luke. That's, that's who Paul... So Titus gets sent to Corinth with who we think is Luke. So Luke knows him. Luke writes the book of Acts, but Luke doesn't include Titus in it. Why? No clue. <laughs> it's one of those things you just go, okay, must have been a reason for it. So now, it's been suggested, we can't prove it, but I'd just love to just throw these little things out there, that Titus might have been Luke's brother. Maybe. Uh, but we know a lot about Titus's character from 2 Corinthians and the letter that Paul actually wrote to Titus. This is what we know, some observations. He was a true son in our common faith. He was a genuine brother to the Apostle Paul. He was a partner and a fellow worker with Paul. And he walked in the same spirit as Paul. He walked in the same steps as Paul and lived the same way that Paul did, 2 Corinthians 12. So Titus wanted to be a pattern to other believers in the exact same way that Paul did. Spurgeon says this about Titus. I love this observation. Titus seems to have been a man of great common sense, so that when Paul had anything difficult to be done, he sent Titus. When the collection was to be made at Corinth on behalf of the poor saints at Jerusalem, Paul sent Titus to stir the members up and with him another brother to take charge of the contributions. That's, that's who we think Titus was. A true son in our common faith. It's a common faith. It wasn't, it wasn't an isolated faith. It was one that a lot of people ascribed to. This faith was for the church all the community of believers who accepted the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. White said this, it must not be restricted to a faith shared only by St. Paul and Titus, but like as in written in Jude 3, it is a common faith to all Christians. Now, interesting thing here, I'm going to talk about this a little bit here as well, is that the greeting that Paul gives to Titus is very unique to three letters that he wrote. Of all the letters, he only wrote this greeting to three people. Grace, mercy, and peace. All these other letters, grace and peace. Nothing about mercy. But he wrote to the two pastors, the two ministers, grace, mercy, and peace. Why did he do that? Because I believe Paul was saying, I know you're a pastor. I know you're a minister, and you need mercy. And, and, and if you look at some of the things that I talked about at the beginning of First and Second Timothy, when Paul wrote this, I, I extrapolate a little bit more on this. But the bottom line is, pastors need mercy. Now, what's mercy? Mercy is the withholding of punishment that we do. We've had, we're due it because we did something wrong. So grace, you're not being gracious to me if you don't get mad at me uh, when I do something that upsets you. You're showing me mercy. And that's what pastors need. Pastors are going to get things wrong. 
So they need mercy. They need the withholding of punishment. They don't need you going, yep, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. You did, yeah, okay. Tell me and I'm sorry and I apologize. Even if it's that I'm no good at apologizing. Tell me that so I can at least get better as a pastor, please. So here's the thing. I need mercy. I need you to not just point out my faults and say to me, hey, these are all the things that you did wrong. This is this is what Paul's letting Titus know. You're a pastor. You're going to get things wrong. You need the withholding of punishment because there's things that you've already gotten wrong and you're going to get them wrong. And I would say the same thing to you. Part of my observation to you, if you're somebody watching this and I've done something to upset you, I ask for forgiveness and I'm asking you to withhold punishment even though I'm due it because I know that I need mercy. My observation, what do you observe? Put it down in the comments below. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for Titus being this wonderful man, this man of common sense. And I, I pray, God, that we would be people of common sense. I pray, Lord, that we would be people of grace, of peace and mercy. And Lord, we would take whatever it is that you've committed to us and we'd, we would do whatever we need to do to achieve your eternal purposes in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.